last, I think, this is last, the, the last lecture, so last but not least, we, oh, last but not least, so Marisol is, uh, Marisol Ocampo, that is uh, one of our nurse practitioners in the office, uh, is going to be uh, speaking to us a little bit on immunotherapy toxicities, nothing that she knows about it. She only creates that maybe once or twice a day into our patients. But um, overall, we actually, uh, honestly, uh, we'll have the privilege to hear her. She's super active in looking into a lot of these topics. She's been even collecting data from a lot of the prospective uh, series of uh, even some of the thyroid toxicities and all that. And she probably is one of the most knowledgeable persons in town about managing um, patients with uh, a lot of these uh, side effects. So if I speak any further, she'll kill me because she probably is like dying to get on the, on the stage. She really wants to get here and be kind of like the, on, the, on the center spot. So without further ado, that is all, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here today because the day has finally arrived and after 3.45, I'm gonna get some good night's sleep that I haven't gotten in the last two weeks getting ready for this presentation. So thank you, Karen, thank you so much. So, so today we're gonna, I'm gonna be going over the assessment and management of immune-related adverse events. I'm mainly gonna be going over the management because the assessment part is what we do all the time for our patients, right? The thing to keep in mind is if a patient who is in immunotherapy shows up and complains of, let's say, having a low-grade fever, chest pain, shortness of breath, we're immediately gonna think of what? Pneumonitis, right? And we're gonna put that at the top of our list as a differential diagnosis. However, is that the only thing that we're gonna think about, right? Could the patient have a pulmonary embolism? Could the patient have a bacterial pneumonia? Could they have um, an MI? So, but we're gonna keep in mind that this patient is indeed in immunotherapy, so we're gonna keep pneumonitis at the top of the list, but the assessment is the same. We're gonna work that patient up like we work any other patients. Um, <clears throat> give me a second. So basically, with the adverse events, it gets kind of repetitive of what we do. So you have grace first, you have mild, moderate, severe, and life-threatening. So a lot of the things you're gonna see is for the mild, you do an intervention, a couple maybe, and then for the moderate, you do the same, plus something else, and uh, for severe and life-threatening, you add something else, okay? The important thing here is to know when to. Hold the immunotherapy, continue immunotherapy, hold and then continue, and when to permanently discontinue it, okay? A lot of the um, toxicities or adverse events have no grades, meaning if the patient gets the toxicity or adverse event, that's it, that patient cannot get any more immunotherapy. <clears throat> so, um, why do they occur? We still really don't know what is the precise pathophysiology behind this. Research shows that it could be uh, related to a combination of other reactive T cells, autoantibodies, or pro-inflammatory cytokines. The principles. So here we have, we, we absolutely love in the office to tell patients, you're getting immunotherapy, right? We love to say it, they love to hear it, but we do know that they come with, and, or they could come with adverse events, and some of these can be extremely serious. The uh, amplifying the immune system can cause the T cells to attack healthy cells, and that will um, lead to uh, uh, a, um, a response that mimics autoimmune uh, disorders. And like I said before, they can be serious. Uh, they can occur at any time. They can occur on cycle one, cycle 50, or cycle 100. So you always have to keep in mind, and you can't be like, oh, but she's got 20 cycles before this. No, they can still happen. <clears throat> Um, like I said, they can, uh, the severity can range from mild all the way to life-threatening, and combination therapy tends to be more toxic, um, especially if, because mainly this is going to be the PD-1, PD-L1s, and the CT4L1, which I'm just going to call EP because it's the only one. <laughs> it's just going to make it easier. 
Um, but if you combine two of those, or you combine chemo with immunotherapy or targeted therapy, the toxicity seems to be greater. <clears throat> Some of these toxicities might be lifelong, meaning you're gonna have to treat the patient for the rest of their lives, especially when it comes to um, endocrinopathies. So infusion-related reactions, you will treat them as you treat any other, okay? You're gonna do some, <clears throat> for mild, you're gonna do some um, Benadryl, Tylenol, for moderate, I think I lost it. For moderate, you're gonna do the same, and you might consider some steroids, and for severe grade three and four, you might have to discontinue the immunotherapy. We did have a case um, in Aventura of a patient with lung cancer who developed like angioedema and she ended up in the hospital. We couldn't restart the immunotherapy on that patient because she did end up in the hospital and uh, she, was, she was very sick. For dermatology, is the most common of the adverse events. The median time is about three to five weeks. Um, <clears throat> interesting enough, enough uh, some of these patients, like the patients who, would, who have melanoma and develop vitiligo, those patients tend to have a greater overall survival and progression-free survival, same with dermatitis, okay? Uh, so for macular papillary rash, examine the skin, for myo, we'll do some uh, topical emollients, but we can continue the immunotherapy and maybe do some topical steroids. For grade two, we're gonna do the same, but we're gonna do moderate to high, and we're gonna consider some um, low-dose steroids or high, if you wanna call it, prednisone. And then for severe, we're gonna increase the dose of prednisone further. But as you can see, we're only holding the immunotherapy in this case. We don't have to discontinue unless, you know, it gets bad, but not really. It's not like a hard stop that you cannot give it anymore. Hopefully you'll get to manage the symptoms of the patient. <clears throat> Prioritis, the same thing. Uh, it's pretty much the, the, the same that we saw for the other one. Uh, for bolus dermatitis, this is a little more complicated. For myo, we are already going to treat the patient with high potassium topical steroids. For grade two, which is moderate, we're gonna do already PO uh, steroids or even IV. And if there's no improvement after three days, we're gonna do rituximab. And for grade three or grade four, we might have to permanently discontinue the, the immunotherapy. And the reason for that is the patient gets very sick, they lose a lot of fluid and electrolytes, and obviously the risk of infection is high. So for that patient, you might have to permanently discontinue the drug. <clears throat> So here we have an 82-year-old male with metastatic um, renal cell carcinoma who was put on uh, pembrolizumab, and he developed these pemphigos-like lesions. As you can see, they're like uh, blisters. Uh, at 18 weeks, it was a grade two. We did the topical steroids, which didn't work, and then we moved to uh, PO steroids at a high dose of one milligram per kilo per day. We did also a biopsy, because we referred the patient to dermatology, and we were not able to resume this without the rash coming back. On top of that, this is a picture of a knee, but the patient was getting this in the genitals, okay? So it was really just hard to put the topical steroids there and everything, so basically the quality of life that he was having was low, and we um, decided to just take him off. And Dr. Guster is laughing because that's a knee, okay? I had to zoom in because he had taken the picture of a knee with a huge background. You couldn't even see what was there. <laughs> so for Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, it's a permanent discontinuation. The patient who experiences this, that's it. They will no longer be able to get uh, immunotherapy and they will get really high doses. And also you have to consider IVIG for them. <clears throat> So here we have a 72-year-old male with metastatic esophageal carcinoma. He was started on pembrolizumab, and he developed this psoriasis form rash about 11 weeks after. This is his back, so his whole body was, had this, this rash. We put him on prednisone and topical steroids, and we were able to resume the immunotherapy. However, it took about 
six to eight weeks to begin with for the rush to come down to less, to, uh, less than a grade one. So when it recurred, we decided that we, we couldn't do another eight weeks, you know, because basically the patient was not getting treatment and he was, the, the disease was progressing. So we were, we were just discontinuing the therapy. <clears throat> for endocrine adverse events, the endocrinologists that happen with immunotherapy, they're usually life, uh, lifelong, like the patient would need hormone replacement for their whole life. Um, <clears throat> but as you can see, there's no grade. There's no grade, and none of these require a permanent discontinuation of the immunotherapy. You will basically just replace the hormones and continue the patient on the therapy. So for this, this is a super busy slide, but you're looking at um, hyperglycemia, and the important thing is just to determine, is the patient in DKA? If the patient is in DKA, hospital admission, treat the DKA, refer to endocrinology, and start treatment for diabetes, okay? Insulin, metformin, whatever the endocrinologist wants to do, but we will continue therapy. We're just gonna treat the diabetes and it's gonna be forever. I don't know, it's not gonna get better probably. So here we have a patient, 79-year-old a female with metastatic esophageal carcinoma, received pembrolizumab, and basically less than 30 days after, um, she, as you can see, ah, here, what a problem, hold on. So you can see at the first day, is, that's her baseline before, you see this is baseline, and then she comes back three weeks after therapy, this is what we get, three weeks after, 671. Now we know this, it's probably the cause, we assess for other causes like hyperglycemia, but what do we do? We start treating her, and you see here, she's not at her baseline, but she's better. For hypothyroidism, the same thing you will do for any patient with hypothyroidism, if they do develop it, you gotta put the patient on Centro. I think the important thing about this is basically, um, if the patient were to have a normal or a low DSH with a low free T4, you have to think central. And if you think central, you gotta think, could it be hypofasciitis? Do we have to check cortisol? Do we have to check testosterone in the male patient? Um, like I said, here we'll replace, and the most important thing is to make sure the patient doesn't have uh, adrenal insufficiency as well. Thyrotoxicosis, we see this all the time. Um, the majority of these patients will, like 50 to 90 percent, will progress into, being, uh, to, uh, into having hypothyroidism. So what do we do for the patient who is symptomatic, symptomatic from the thyrotoxicosis, meaning they're having palpitations? Um, we just put them on a beta blocker, okay? And then we will replace the hormone. So look at this here. This is patient's baseline. She's 53, gastric cancer. She gets NIVO, okay? And about two weeks after, she starts, her baseline starts to change. But what do we have? We have a high uh, level of T4 and a low level of TSH. This happens again, but what happens after? Hypo, okay? So what are we doing this time when she's asymptomatic? Nothing. We watch and wait, okay? And when she is, we start hormone replacement, all right? Hypophysiitis, um, you do the assessment, what do you do? You hold the immunotherapy until the acute symptoms resolve. But, and you're only gonna do steroids in a patient who's having symptoms of mass effect, meaning that the swelling is causing vision loss, headache. In the other patients, we're not gonna do steroids. We're gonna try to hold on the steroids and eventually replay the physiologic um, doses, all right? <clears throat> so here we have our patient. 53-year-old male with metastatic melanoma. He gets nebo ep okay? And about less than what, six, less than a month later, right? Yeah, more or less, like two months. He comes into the office feeling weak, nausea. He can't even walk. The, the, he comes in in a wheelchair. And we see the sodium. He gets sent to the ER. So let's look at that same day, the 16th of November. Look what the cortisol is doing. One, okay? Then Dr. Kuznir in the hospital orders a testosterone to make sure if this is, you know, is it really? Look at the testosterone. 
right? And the thyroid, which I mentioned before, look at the TSH, right? With the high over here and the T4. So we know this is central. And what do we do for this patient? He basically, we, after that, we have to send him to the endocrinology because can we manage hypothyroidism? Yes, we can. Can we do testosterone replacement, adrenal insufficiency? We cannot, okay? So we will just refer the patient to our endocrinology friends. For fatigue, uh, fatigue is, uh, we're just gonna continue immunotherapy. Uh, we might consider a low dose steroids for the patients with a grade two. And for severe fatigue, grade three to four, we might have to call or, continue or uh, consider just discontinuing the therapy. However, I think for fatigue, it's so important to check other things and make sure it's not like the thyroid that is being affected or basically that the patient is actually having disease progression, okay? Uh, for GI adverse events, they're more common uh, with, uh, with EP uh, and, and more common if their EP is combined with other immunotherapies. Uh, so first I'm gonna show you a picture and it's not a picture of diarrhea. This is the picture that I wanna show you because when you ask a patient how many episodes of diarrhea are you having, you cannot get a straight answer, okay? The patient will go on. Well, I woke up this morning, I had a piece of toast, and then I usually, use, you know, I do milk, and I'm like, so I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and, and, and if Dr. Pusser comes in, I am not getting an answer at all, because that conversation will go, me too, I have my coffee, but I don't have it with milk. And then, you know, I read my newspaper, and then in the second, the second that he stops talking, I'm like, how many episodes are you having? <laughs> I can, it's just so impossible, but you need to know that in order to see how you're gonna manage that patient, some of the patients are calling from home, right? So I'm not gonna be able to check their pulse, look at the mucous membranes, I'm not gonna be able to do that, so I wanna know how many episodes. And sometimes I help them, after they tell me all this, and I don't have a number, I'm like, for example, how many episodes of diarrhea you had yesterday? No answer. How, did you just tell me, just, is it three, four, five? You know, I'm, I get like, but it's really funny, I don't know if that happens to other people, that you cannot get an answer when you ask that question. It's so hard for patients to just say 10, I'm having 10. And they're like, great, you, you're gonna be in the hospital, but, but at least you have an answer, okay? Um, so for diarrhea, I get extremely, extremely worried when I hear a patient has diarrhea. I know some of the calls I pass a lot to Alex. I'm like, for this, oh, just take Tylenol for it. But the other day, he's like, he's having diarrhea and he is in Avelumab. I was like, I need to call this patient because I want to know if they're gonna, how sick they are, right? Um, so basically, really, that you have to be serious about it and you gotta treat it early. So a study found that patients who were started on, not only the steroids, but maybe that were not responding to steroids and they had to do infliximab, uh, those patients did better and were on steroids for less time than the patients that took forever to basically, you know, do more aggressive therapy. Uh, so you can, you can see it there in the highlight that you're gonna do the high dose, and if not, you're gonna do the infliximab or vedolizumab, which is, um, has very, um, has got a specific effects. For severe, as you can see, for the EP, you're gonna discontinue, but you might be able to resume the PD-1 or pd one if you're using them in combination. But for grade four, that's it. The patient will not be able to get immunotherapy anymore. And once again, high dose steroids and consider adding infliximab or vedolizumab. <clears throat> Hepatic adverse events. So basically, elevated transaminitis, the grades, are, um, the grades are done by the upper limit of normal, okay? And as you can see the, here for mild, you can consider holding and assessing. For moderate, you're gonna do the prednisone. Uh, for severe, you're gonna hold and do prednisone but a higher doses. You can consider adding mycophenolate but not infliximab. So we don't use infliximab for hepa, uh, hepatitis or for elevating transaminitis because it's been associated with acute liver failure. So we're not gonna use that. 
For life-threatening, meaning greater than 20 above the upper limit of normal, we're going to permanently discontinue. We're going to do uh, high-dose steroids, inpatient care, and monitor the patient very, very closely. Uh, so here, this is a patient of ours, 72-year-old female with lung cancer. She basically, after six weeks of starting immunotherapy, she developed grade four, okay, um, toxicity. So here's her, let's see, here's the, the after. So she's fine here, fine here. She shows up here, she's still okay. Here, uh, still, but here, here we're having a heart attack, right there in the office. Look at the bilirubin, it's almost at five, and the enzymes, they're above like, what, 30 at this point? She looks good, so we were able to keep her off the hospital. As you can see, this is the same day, we just repeat, make sure this is not a fluke from the lab, and then we're able to basically just do high-dose steroids, and then she comes in every day for tests, 5-1. You can see they start slowly going down, right? But what I wanted to show is that at some point here, we try to, you know, we're tapering down the steroids, but here, what do we have? An increase. So that's been shown in data, the patients with hepatitis and pneumonitis, when you're trying to taper down the steroids, you might have to go up again because they're gonna have toxicity again. So we try that and eventually she goes back to her baseline. This is almost 10 weeks later, okay? So clearly we cannot resume immunotherapy on this patient. She, thank God, didn't get super sick, but she could have been really, really sick. This is the same thing. The same thing, but just with the bilirubin level. Pancreatic adverse events, elevation of, of uh, amylase and lipase. Same thing, we look at the, at the um, upper level of normal. And we are gonna just basically assess the patient. And for the most part, we can continue the immunotherapy for a mild. For here also, we can continue, all right? But if the patient has evidence of acute pancreatitis, we're gonna have to basically hold here the immunotherapy. Um, and for severe, we're gonna permanently discontinue. Again, you can see the same thing. It's steroids, you just, you just go higher and higher on the dose. So this is one of her patients, a 77-year-old who got uh, with lung cancer, he got Durvalumab. And you can see he complained that he was having epigastric pain. So we think, oh, let's just check the amylase and lipase, and boom, they're high. So we hold immunotherapy, right? And we do a CT, and therefore, the CT shows findings are suggestive of acute pancreatitis. This patient was not really sick. He was just having epigastric pain. So he falls really on the moderate um, toxicity. However, we, we could have continued, but he didn't want to. That's just... That's life, right? Some patients will decide, I don't want to continue, and you might never see them again. Like, that's the truth. And this is what happened with this patient. He said, I don't want it again. We make sure he went back to normal, and he never showed up in the office again, okay? Uh, so that's, that's, that's the truth, but we could have continued if he wanted it. Cardiovascular, you're going to assess the patient and basically do what you will do. Uh, with myocarditis, sometimes it presents with myositis and myasthenia gravis. This is just the workup. This is the assessment part. For the treatment, myocarditis, there's no grade. The patient shows up with this, no more immunotherapy for you, okay? So, and very, very high dose steroids. Like as here, you don't even do the 0.5 or the, you just straight go to gram, one gram per day, okay? IV, three to five days, and then you slowly taper them down. If there's no response within 24 hours, you can use another immunosuppressive agent. Uh, here we have a patient, 58-year-old male with metastatic renal cell. He got epinevo. After cycle two, he developed myocarditis, myositis. He was in California at the time. He left Florida, went to California. We ended up knowing that he required an insertion of a permanent pacemaker. He didn't want to take the steroids. Okay, not very smart. But okay, he didn't want to take the steroids, and he shows up here six weeks later to the office, and look at the enzymes, okay? They're still elevated, but of course, if he's not taking the steroids, it's just really difficult to get those, those uh, markers to go down and for the patient to, to feel better, basically. Um, for musculoskeletal adverse events, we have inflammatory arthritis, 
mild. Basically, we're gonna do steroids, but in this case, we're gonna do 10 to 20 milligrams daily for two to four weeks. So we're not doing the 0.5 or the one, we're just doing a lower dose. Moderate, there we go to the 0.5 per kilo per day for a few weeks. And if the patient has severe, and the reason for this is that they might end up with joint erosion, which is uh, you cannot reverse it. So here I have put uh, one of her patients, she's a 71-year-old female with MSI high colorectal cancer. She was on Pembro and developed inflammatory arthritis. She, this is her hobby, she doesn't work. Her hobby is to make little flowers and things out of magazine papers, right? So imagine how your hands have to be to be able to do this. So she came crying saying, look, I can't even open a door, no? Let alone do these things that basically this is what I do, right? So we held immunotherapy, put her on 0.5 milligrams per kilo per day for three weeks. We were able, it got better, we resumed, but what happened? Again, she's complaining, not as severe, but she still has that pain. So we just kept her at 10 milligrams uh, daily until her therapy uh, was done, which was like about two years. So uh, you can see here how important it is for our patients to be able to keep the quality of life and doing the things that they love to do. Uh, myalgias and myositis, once again, sometimes they are along with myocarditis. Same thing, we're gonna assess which level it is. Holding, hold, high dose prednisone, maybe some muscle testing, IVIG, and even plasmapheresis, infleximab, rituximab, um, in order to, to help with the suppression. Polymyalgia, pretty much the same. We have that, and then we have giant cell arthritis. Same thing, we can continue, and then for moderate, we hold. We do steroids, same things for this. Basically, I'm showing you that it's the same thing, but there's not necessarily a red flag to say you cannot continue with immunotherapy if they do develop the side effects. Nervous system, as you can see here, myasthenia, what moderate, or grade three and four for severe, you cannot give it anymore, okay? The patient uh, could end up with respiratory paralysis in the hospital, intubated. So the patient that presents with this, you have to permanently discontinue, treat as you will treat any case, right, with this drug, and then do the steroids. Guillain-Barre, same thing. The patient that gets this, never again will see immunotherapy. And in this patient, we're also gonna have to do, besides the steroids, we will have to do IVIG or uh, plasmapheresis in order to, to, to help them. Peripheral neuropathy, pretty much the same. Hold immunotherapy, monitor symptoms, and for a grade two, we can do the steroids. Uh, severe, we're gonna treat as Guillain-Barre, which we just saw. Other two of the things that could happen of the adverse events require permanently discontinuing uh, immunotherapy. Aseptic meningitis is one and the other one is encephalitis, okay? Transfer myelitis, same thing. So do you see that trend? Some of them require holding, treating, but for this, for the neuros, you basically have to completely discontinue therapy. Vision changes, uveitis, um, and here epicleritis. You treat uh, by continuing, holding, maybe consider steroids right here, and for this, the same. Pneumonitis, this is, it has a low incidence, but it can be fatal, okay? Uh, so these patients we have to identify very quickly so we can um, treat them. For mild, we'll do, we can hold, we can reassess, we can do a CT chest. For grade two, we're gonna do the same, we're gonna make sure it's nothing else, right? We're gonna check for viral pathogens, we're gonna do the whole workup, and for already grade two, we can start high dose steroids. If there's no improvement in like 48 to 72 hours, we might not, we're gonna treat as grade three. Which what happens in grade three? We have to permanently discontinue because the patient can be like extremely, extremely sick and end up intubated and the whole thing. Uh, we're gonna do really high dose steroids in IV form. And then we can also consider adding one of this. So here we have a 71 year old female with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Basically, she gets two cycles of pembrolizumab. She shows up on the office August 2nd with shortness of breath, low to side of 86% and a fever. So what are we thinking? Pneumonitis, could it be COVID? Now everything has to be COVID until proven otherwise. So could it be a PE? This is the scan before she started treatment. This is a beautiful scan. You see, the lungs are clear. 
This is when she shows up on, to the emergency department that day, full of consolidation, okay? This is getting steroids, right? And then this is by the time she gets discharged. What, a month later she's discharged from the hospital, we have a better. But she was really, really sick. And Dr. Kuzni was really, really worried um, that, about this patient, but I'm not gonna say why, but anyways, uh, for, but they can get really, really sick. For renal adverse events, uh, we're gonna monitor the creatinine, for myo, we're gonna hold, follow up on the protein, and you. it's always good to consider nephrology right away on these patients. And for a grade two, also based on the creatinine level above the baseline, we can do the steroids. Severe, also hold and reassess and high dose prednisone. If it doesn't get better, you can consider adding one of this. So the principles of steroid use in management, how am I with time? Anyone? Okay. Uh, <laughs> for the corticosteroids, so you can see I'm pretty much the main thing that we use to treat the adverse events. Early intervention is key, so as a nurse and to my fellow nurses, we have to identify the patients early in order to treat them. Uh, the use of steroids has not been shown to cause less efficacy of um, the immunotherapy against the tumor, which is super important for the patient because they think, oh, the steroids, they suppress the immune therapy. Immune therapy is trying to, you know, maximize the immune response. Nothing has shown that using steroids will decrease um, the, uh, basically the effect of the immunotherapy. Sometimes you have to keep the steroids longer, as you saw for that patient, pneumonitis, hepatitis, we had to give the patient for like 10 weeks. If you're gonna have the patient for a long time on steroids, four or more weeks, con or six to eight weeks, for, um, you have to consider giving prophylaxis for, for PGP as well for fungal infections, PPI or H2 therapy for those with high risk of gastritis, and if the patient is gonna be in long term, let's say that lady that was on 10 milligrams until the end of therapy, uh, consider the risk for osteoporosis and supplement as needed. Education, so I was looking for a nice thing to put about immunotherapy, uh, and this is what I found. Confused about immunotherapy and the side effects, you're not alone, or you aren't alone. And I was like, this is not what we want. We nurses do a good job educating our patients, right? That's gonna make a whole difference in how an adverse events will hurt our patients, right? So basically, we do educate our patients. Sometimes our patients don't listen. No, just kidding. Sometimes they don't, but, but we just have to reinforce, right? Reinforcement, reinforcement. Eventually, they're gonna get it, and they're not gonna call you and say, I've been having 10 episodes of diarrhea for the last 10 days, because that's not good, right? Uh, we want to tell them, first episode of diarrhea, you give us a call, because you know they're not going to give you a call for the first, they might give you a call if they have five, so you want to be proactive, okay? And, and that's pretty much it. It's a lot of repetition, but just, I guess the most important is remember when to continue, when to hold, when to permanently discontinue immunotherapy for the patient. Oh, yeah, and re-challenge, when to re-challenge. Any questions? <laughs> It's a lot. I don't know what you're saying, Dr. Kuzin, but I can hear you. Mine. Some. Behave, please. Questions? No questions? Yay, we're done! Thank you, thank you.